I mean, I think, you know, again, it's teaching proper biomechanics, like especially if they're high schoolers and, and, and young young runners, it's, it's really important to learn because like a lot of kids and people haven't been properly instructed on how to run, right? You just get out there and you start running. And, you know, you see some people going like this, you know, you see some people running away up here, you know, there, there definitely is a, a balance of, you know, keeping the hand. There, there was an old saying, the pocket chin, you know, or from your pocket to your chin, pocket chin, pocket chin, pocket chin, right? But, you know, I think linear movement this way, and when you think about it, and not when you think about it, the fact of the matter is, is your hands, whatever your hands are going to do, your feet will somewhat mimic how they hit the ground, right? If I'm, If my hands are moving like this, my feet, are gonna are gonna want to move like this? It's just a kind natural of a neural feedback bio, loop. Bio, biomechanic, right? So what you want to do is you want to kind of drive your hands in the direction that you want your knees to go, right? Your knees your knees are gonna respond to what your hands are doing. So when I drive my right hand forward, linearly and straight, my left knee is gonna follow that pattern, right? So you do want to have that, and you want to swing naturally from the shoulder. And, and drive the knee with your hands, you know? And that comes in handy that way, as the faster you go, the more important that becomes. I mean, you look at sprinters, right? Look at sprinters. The sprinters are getting here and they're getting way back here, right? They're driving the arms because they want to drive those knees as quick as possible. But you can't run a marathon like that, right? right. You're going to run out of gas. And you see most marathoners, they may be just right in here, right? And staying maybe being a little more efficient with their energy that way. So there's a balance, right? You see an 800 meter runner or a 1500 meter runner at the end of a race, they're going to go to those arms and they're going to try to really drive those knees to the finish. But the more linear they can be, the more power they can generate forward than being like here or way up here, right? That's not up here isn't going to generate a lot of power if I'm running up here like this. I got to get that peck to elongate create that spring and then pop the hand forward. That's where you get the power. When you, when you swing back, that's with that triangle. When you swing back, you're engaging that pec muscle, that power, that spring. And when it gets here, it's gonna spring the arm forward, right? And that's how you generate power. So that's really what they're trying to talk about there. And I get it, like it's efficiency and, that, and it makes sense, but there has to be a balance on how much and, you, and, and because of your knowledge of anatomy, you go to the next layer of not just looking at the motion patterns, but really understanding what the pecs need to do. I know that's talked a lot about now in downhill skiing, you know, using your rib cage as you're going down into the fall line of the turn. So all mm -hmm. these things are connected. And of course, you know, you would know, know it very well. So I'm sure that also with your runners, you were able to kind of uh, mobilize as, as you saw fit, which is just a tremendous uh, asset for anybody that could have somebody of your caliber uh, on their team. Talk to me a little bit about cadence and plyometric step ups, step downs. You know, it gets a little confusing, I think, even for me to understand what's the best way to uh, coach people to put those, uh, those box step ups and box step downs into, mm -hmm. into the program. What is your philosophy with using those types of techniques? Let's say for now, middle distance uh, runners, for yeah, instance. I, again, I think it all, it all has its place for explosiveness, right? I mean, if you have a, a 5,000 meter runner or a 10,000 meter runner that's doing like, you know, high mileage, which, you know, a lot of those runners will run 80 miles a week or more, right? And then, and then you're going to have them do box jumps. You know, like you have to find the balance, like maybe an 800 meter runner needs more explosiveness or a steeplechaser might need more explosiveness because he actually has to jump or he or she has to jump. So finding the balance between what what is needed and what is necessary for a particular athlete, you know, and what their event is like a 100 meter runner is going to need a lot of explosiveness, right? They're going to come out and need to really have some explosiveness where a 5,000 meter runner may need that, but maybe not as much. So you have to find that balance and how high does a 5,000 meter runner need to really good jump? Does he need to jump 24 inches or 36 inch box jumps? You're putting the, the joint, the joint stress, the foot stress, they're already pounding the ground, you know, 
thousands and tens of thousands of times. So you, you got to also look at your training and say, you know, why are we doing this? And, and then if you're training for your ants, especially your ancillary training, which would be plyometrics and box jumps and these other, if that's going to get you hurt, then why are you doing, it? you know? So you have to find the balance. Like, I think there's a certain level of plyometrics, like even jumping, you know, hopping over six inch hurdles or hopping over 20, 12 inch hurdles just on the track is, is even appropriate for some um, athletes in, in their perspective events, you know? Because again, if your training is ancillary training, meaning if you're a runner and the training that you're doing to help you running, like all that extra stuff, box jumps, plyometrics, drills, if that's getting you hurt, then then you've completely defeated the purpose of doing.